I still believe that what money managers and investors will go through is unseen. We have not seen anything like that before. Hello, I'm Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics, and today I have an important interview for you. Felix Zuloff is one of the most fascinating and visionary macro investors I know. His research is read by the world's most noted professional investors, and today he joins me for what's become something of an annual tradition here at Global Macro Update. Felix speaks with media once per year, and I am fortunate that he carves out time for you and I. Felix and I get into his views on the direction of the U.S. and global economy, stock markets, and bond markets, as well as the potential outcomes of today's global conflicts. At a time when geopolitical tensions are at a multi-decade high, if you are an investor, you're going to want to hear what Felix has to say. Take a minute to subscribe to our channel, and thanks for joining us here at Global Macro Update. Felix, it's always great to see you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've been looking forward to this conversation for for months, really, because I just it's, I, I have a hard time thinking of another point in in my professional career where so many smart people disagree so much and are calling for different things, everything from a market crash and a big, deep recession to uh, no recession, soft landing, smooth sailing. Um, I, I think one thing that has surprised everybody is just how strong the U.S. economy has been after such a steep rise by the Fed of, of, of interest rates. What are your thoughts on that? Is the economy really as resilient as it seems, or have we just not seen the lag effect of these steep increases in, in interest rates? It's a good question. Uh, I also thought that at this time of the year, we would see the weakness uh, coming to the surface in the economy. I do not expect, they or never expected a deep recession, but uh, a shallow one in terms of magnitude to the downside. And that's still my my forecast. Uh, I think the rise in interest rates and the sharp rise in interest rates hurt certain sectors in the economy, which we already see, construction, housing, automobiles to some degree. And uh, you see also in uh, credit card delinquencies, you have the sharpest increase in year over year rate of change, uh, I think in 20 years or in 30, even in 30 years. Uh, it's still at the low level, but it's moving in the wrong direction or in the right direction if you forecast a, uh, a softer economy. Um, I think the rise in interest rates will uh, be felt over time because refinancing is coming on with a lag if, I, impact. And as that happens, I think you will see that the consumer will eventually uh, slow down. I do not believe it will be a deep recession because the inventory situation in the US is not extreme. Uh, so I do not see a, a, a deep dive or anything like that. Um, my hunch, however, is that um, there will be a recession in 24 or a weaker economy in 24 with declining corporate profits. Uh, we will feel the tightening that we have seen before. We will feel the uh, impact of the inverse yield curve and all kind of that. I think the Fed made a change in March of this year when we had uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, banking crisis. Mm -hmm. And the banking crisis led to the si situation that the Fed and other central banks in Europe as well injected liquidity at large quantities into the system. And I think that liquidity together with the games that the Treasury played with liquidity, with the uh, general account at the Fed, and with the repo, uh, reverse repo uh, uh, on the balance sheet, all of that added more liquidity than one would have expected without knowing that, you know. And therefore, I think those who expected a recession have been wrong because of those reasons. And uh, the repo rates are now down to 1.3 trillion. And uh, in, in, in my uh, opinion, 
there is 1.3 trillion to go. And that means by late Q1, that effect is over. And then it is over for real. So you cannot do it in encore. You, you cannot uh, repeat that situation. And Janet Yellen tried to um, prevent the bond market from uh, playing havoc when sort of a fiscal crisis uh, began to appear. And she just didn't issue many bonds and issued everything on the short end of the yield curve. And the money market funds, they got so much money uh, that flowed over from bank deposits into money market funds, they picked up and bought the, the reverse repos. And, uh, and, and now the reverse repos, because of that, are coming down. And so I think you, you had some special factors relaxing or reliquifying the system, or, but primarily the financial system more than the real economic system. And that extended everything. But my hunch still is that uh, we'll have a weaker economy in 24 and we'll have weaker corporate profits in 24. And the market um, uh, going higher first will go lower afterwards. One of the things that surprised me is we, we had Silicon Valley Bank, huge bank, for assets failed. Uh, like you said, Treasury, the Fed, they moved very quickly. Uh, nothing else happened. And there's really, there, there hasn't been that proverbial other shoe dropping. Um, I, I, were you expecting something else to break or do you think something else might break soon? It's actually the first time that uh, interest rates or bond yields seem to have peaked for the cycle without an accompanying effect like a market crash, a recession, a big bankruptcy case or anything like that. So maybe this time is different, but those are dangerous words. Um, my hunch is that uh, bond yields will go lower first. Very short term, they are bouncing. And then I think they go lower maybe to 370 or so. My technical work pointed to lower bond yields. but. My hunch is that something is not the way it should be, and therefore we could have another spike in bond yields starting sometimes in Q1 uh, into the middle of the year, and maybe at that time something breaks. You know, my my technical work is uh, is uh, calling for this decline, which could be about 370, and then we could go up 200 basis points. Uh, the whole magnitude for the cycle on the downside, I think, could be to about 3% plus minus 25 basis points. But something is not um, the right way. And what I saw is the bond market bulls are now in charge. And the consensus on soft landing is extreme. And when forecasts and experts agree to such a extreme degree, then something else is usually going to happen. That's uh, Bob Farrell's uh, rule, and, uh, and I think he's right on that. And I see that the positioning in the treasury market is the most extreme ever. Uh, JP Morgan did uh, a survey at the treasury desk among their clients and their clients have never been as long treasuries as they are now wow. uh, in the whole history, in the whole history. So it's the most extreme. Then there was the Global Fund Manager Survey by Bank of America. Um, you know, the most attractive asset for the next 12 months, uh, they said, I think, 54 or 53% bonds which is very unusual. Normally it's equities. Equities are only 25 or 29 percent. So that's another extreme. Then there is an extreme in how many bond fund uh, global fund managers believe that uh, long-term bond yields have peaked and go down over the next 12 months. And this number is something like 70 percent or so, never seen before. It's about twice as high as the extremes in the past 20 years. 
And uh, when I compare all these numbers uh, to the last extreme that we saw, that was in late 08, early 09. And we had then another 50 or 100 basis points down. And six months later, it was higher. So I think the bond market is positioned for a big decline in bond yields. And if the decline only goes to 370 and then goes up again, we are in for trouble. Then we could see a liquidation wave. And then we could see 550, 570 or something like that. And maybe at that time, something will break and we will have the normal yield peak that we see in a cycle accompanied by a bankruptcy case, a recession, uh, or a market crash or, or something like that. A few months ago, I had a, converse, a similar conversation with Louis Gov, who, who you know. Mm -hmm. And Louis and I were talking about uh, the size of the U.S. government debt and, and how there is a wave of issuance coming from the U.S., from the Treasury. How, how does that factor in? Because it seems like the market is ignoring this massive amount of supply that's going to be coming. Well, the market was afraid of it, uh, and that's why yields went up uh, because of that, uh, and buyers held back, uh, and that's why yields rose. But the wave never came because Janet Yellen was uh, uh, financing and funding uh, everything at the short end, o almost uh, the whole uh, uh, Treasury uh, government at the short end and not the long end. So she protected the bond market. But this doesn't mean that it won't come. It means that the average majority on government debt has declined to a level where it could, I'm not sure, but it could even be illegal because there are rules in funding. It could be even illegal, and it would force Janet Yellen next year to issue even more percentage-wising bonds. And this could contribute to what I said, that there could be a possible spike. I would pick um, the second quarter for that, uh, and that would give us then the low in the stock market. You know, Because if that happens, then bond investors will get burned and equity investors will get both because the, the, the equity market is, is trading off the bond market at the present time. The correlation is uh, quite clear. Even if yields go down, say 200 basis points, right? A, a, a lot. There's still a lot of companies out there, uh, at, at least in the U.S. and the small cap side, I've heard as many as 30 to 40 percent of the Russell 2000 aren't profitable. So how how do these companies continue to exist uh, w when they're going to be facing an actual cost of capital for the for perhaps the first time in their existence? You're absolutely right, but the market doesn't care about it. The market is focusing yeah. on what drives the index, and those are the magnificent sevens. and And that's another problem I uh, I like to uh, focus on very briefly. We have seen um, extreme concentration in the late 1990s in telecom and technology stocks. Mm -hmm. Those were maybe 50 to 70 stocks. We had seen extreme concentration in the nifty 50s in the early 1970s. And whenever you see such a tremendous concentration, you are in for trouble sooner or later. What we have now is we have for the last 15 years, passive investing has become the way to go, and I would say if being a Fed, uh, and and this is worldwide. And when you look at the world and someone does worldwide uh, indexing, so the world index is 62% US. So 62% of all the money goes to the US. In the US, 30% go into seven stocks, you see? And the concentration that we have now in the market is much bigger than anything we have ever seen before. So the point is this, if for any reason the market begins to turn down and some people begin selling, these stocks will hurt dramatically because there is nothing else to sell. 
professional money managers had to be in these stocks to perform. And when you are a professional money manager, you are measured in performance. And if you were not in those seven stocks, you could you you did you did underperform. And if you wanted to outperform, you had to go to a lower weight of those seven stocks. So I have recently seen a survey that says the largest uh, U.S. hedge funds have seventy uh, percent of their positions in ten stocks. I'm not sure whether that is right or not, but. It is symptomatic of the extreme concentration and one-sidedness in portfolios. So I think for whatever reason, the market will go down. And I expect that sometimes in uh, uh, in the Q1, I expect the market to peak, probably at marginal new highs in the indices. Uh, Then I think we are in for not just a plain vanilla correction, but for something very serious. And that does not mean that we will see a deep recession or deep economic problems. It just means that an extreme positioning in the market will be balanced again. And that could mean a lot of downside in the indices. So downside is usually followed by opportunity. What, what what comes after that? What, what would be what would you be ready to do? What's your crash plan, if you will? Okay. Well, I I think first we go uh, higher to uh, the upper four thousand uh, four forty nine hundred forty nine fifty or something like that, and then I think we break below the October lows of last year, which was thirty five hundred. So quite a big decline, and. Uh, You know, you rarely have a year when you have an important high and an important low in the same year. We had it in 22, we had it in 20, we had it in 2018, but those are exceptions. If you go further back, it was 1987, then it was, um, I think, 1962, uh, 1937. So it does not occur very often. And I think we will then have a high in the first half of the year, probably in Q1, and then a low in summer. And and if I'm right, and we have that decline in asset prices, it affects the consumer. You know, lower asset prices affects the consumer's balance sheet. And he may be more reluctant to spend. And we will have a shallow um, uh, economy, uh, uh, a weakish uh, economy, and we will have geopolitical problems on top of that. And and all uh, all that, and maybe even the spike in the bond yields for the reasons explained. If you get that, then you get the authorities to stimulate. And then they will become aggressive in stimulating. And inflation rates will be... Two to three percent, or something like that, by summer '24, and then they stimulate, and that should really trigger the next up cycle. And then we go higher, and I expect it to go to uh, six thousand or seven thousand on the S uh, S and P, um, and uh, it will be a tremendous run. I said last time we spoke, Ed, I said this decade is the decade of the roller coasters. Yes. And I still, I still believe that. I still believe that what money managers and investors will go through in coming years is unseen. We have not seen anything like that before with the big swings in magnitude on both sides of the market. Um, the long-term bull market is not, the secular bull market is not dead yet. I think we have higher highs ahead in 25 uh, maybe even early 26, and then I think it will uh, it will crash uh, because if they stimulate, it's not only good for equity prices; it's also positive and bullish for commodity prices. And commodity prices uh, then go up. Uh, we have the second big up leg in the secular bull market in commodities, and that means that we are probably dealing with over 10 percent inflation in uh, 26 or so, I would say. And oil prices uh, near 200. If we have 
if we have the war escalating eventually in the Middle East, which is a big risk. Uh, if Iran, for whatever reason, and we, we could talk about this uh, if we have time, if Iran gets attacked, they will close the Straits of Hormuz. Mm -hmm. And if they do that, then you take out 25% of uh, global supply of oil on a daily basis. And then you have $400 oil uh, as a spike that would melt our system. So those are the risks we are dealing with. The geopolitical situation is extremely fragile. I uh, recently listened to um, one of the best uh, contemporary historians, uh, Neil Ferguson, and uh, he had changed. Uh, six months before I heard him, he was more moderate. And the last time, that was two months ago, I met him in uh, Zurich in a small group. Uh, I was surprised how much he sounded like what I tell my subscribers, you know. And he said the geopo geopolitical risk is underestimated everywhere. It is dangerous place out there. And we do not have any diplomats that could fix the problem. So... Uh, that's the situation we are dealing with. Usually, geopolitics or politics does not affect the market for very long. You know, if something happens, it's a short-term affair. However, if geopolitics or politics change the secular trend of the economic framework, then it affects markets. And I think that's what we are seeing. You know, the unipolar world order that has been very U.S. centric with the U.S. as the major hegemon, that is over. That's yeah, gone. I agree. And we have now, we have now a transition period, which I would call disorder. And the world has to find a new order, which will likely be a multi, multipolar order. And, and if we, cannot achieve that through diplomacy, we have to go through wars. And when the top dog is weakened or considered to be weakened, you have all sorts of conflicts popping up to the surface. Armenia, Serbia, Guyana, uh, yes. Gaza, what have you. And, and I think this will continue because the BRICS are considering the U.S. as weak. And... Uh, and the U.S. is not in a strong position. Uh, I quote again uh, 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 a famous historian who said, um, the U.S. needs another 10 years to be ready for war. So the U.S. is not ready for war. Uh, and that creates risks, much higher risks than we assume. So this makes for a very volatile world, very volatile markets. And the biggest assets uh, investors uh, should have is an open mind and flexibility because the moves will be quite dramatic. I think the shorter moves, the sell-offs that we are seeing now could go down to 4,300 and then we could go up to 4,900. You know, those are big moves. Huge. And then down to the low 3,000. <laughs> you know, it's interesting you mentioned Guyana, Guyana because... Uh, you're the first person outside of another geopolitical expert, Renee Aninao, who uh, you probably run into at the Strategic Investment Conference. Uh, he, he's the only other person that has mentioned that conflict. Um, it, the, most investors are only hearing and seeing the big stories in the news, so Ukraine and the Middle East. And there's so much in the geopolitical sphere happening below the surface quietly that we just we being the u.s just don't seem to have a handle on so guyana's if i understand it correctly is uh, is it's basically uh venezuela ex trying to extend its borders to grab the natural resources of guyana and guyana what can they do about it you know i cover geopolitics a lot in my uh, reports to subscribers and I said at the very beginning of the conflict in Ukraine that Ukraine will lose that war. And now it's decided already. That war is decided. It's lost for the West. Uh, we can talk about uh, how it will end, etc. I uh, have certain ideas. 
but it's lost. And the West will not contribute a lot more because it's a black hole. You think too much money. Uh, Israel, uh, Middle East is a very difficult situation. Uh, it always has been, always has been. If you go back in uh, history to the um, uh, Ottoman Empire, etc., and I think the Arab nations, Shiites as well as Sunnis, have agreed, and they are in agreement how to behave. They are pushing for a second nation, for a two-state solution, which is almost impossible when you understand how the West Bank looks like today. And uh, I think they are on, on one line, they are in agreement. And, you know, the Saudis and the Iranians, uh, they have not been very good friends. Uh, the Sunnis and the Shiites, they were like the Catholics and the Protestants in the old days. Uh, but but they are together, and I think this is the power broker China who brought them together. So it's not the power broker in the Middle East is now China. It's not the U.S. anymore. And... Uh, and, and it's a very difficult situation for Israel. If the Gaza operation is terminated and they turn to, uh, towards uh, Hezbollah in the north and uh, attack in Syria, uh, then that would call for Russia to uh, participate because Russia and Syria have agreements, military agreements. So that okay. would pull Russia in. Um, if um, in Syria has also contracts with Iran, so it would pull Iran in. If Iran is there, uh, then of course Israel is on the, on the other side, and then it pulls the U.S. in. So this is a very dangerous situation. And my fear is that Netanyahu, being in difficulties in no war times, because he's. Uh, um, uh, prosecuted uh, for corruption, he's interested in extending the war mm -hmm. for selfish reasons. So I think this is a very delicate and difficult situation we should monitor as investors. Felix, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but you you, you mentioned the power broker being China. Uh, we can't we can't end the conversation without having at least a, a brief conversation about China. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you feel like commodities uh commodity prices will eventually go up and i want to i want to press you on that a little bit because i have a hard time seeing how commodity prices go up when china's economy is where it's at today my understanding is it's it's struggling. It's it's low growth. They have their own serious issues with real estate. I know that's not the entire economy, but uh, Xi seems to be focused on other areas right now. H how do you reconcile the two or kind of weak economy for China and, and yet a commodity growth? It's a very good question, Ed. Uh, first of all, if the West uh, expects uh, China to stimulate like in the old days and create high growth, they will be disappointed. That will not that will not materialize. Um, China is in a structural problem. They have to deflate uh, their real estate sector, and that will cost a lot of money. Uh, and eventually, they have to monetize it. And uh, if you monetize something like that, your currency goes down. So they will uh, proceed very carefully, and it will be a drawn out affair. I would say at least ten years. That means that China is out as a factor to bring high growth to the world economy. You know, China has been the driver for many years. That's over. That game is over. It's passed. The world economy is actually growing in real terms at 1.5%. And 1.5% in the past uh, 70 years has always been a recession. So the world economy is actually in a recession-like situation. Uh, I do not expect China to increase uh, demand for commodities in a major way. What I do expect, however, is that the commodity suppliers will restrain supply. So I expect the rise in commodity prices not due to strong demand, but due to weak supply. Okay. And uh, all you need is a certain normalization of demand. 
and restrain supply. Keep in mind that 75% of the commodities in today's world are controlled by the BRICS. And in the power struggle and conflict between the autocracies and the democracies, um, you know, the the BRICS are more uh, uh, autocracies and they will use that weapon of commodities in the conflict to weaken the other side. I think that is uh, the solution to your question. So when I put all of this together, that part of the world that gets that I'm most concerned about, I think, is Europe. I mean, it seems like Europe's in a very, very precarious you, situation. Europe is the big loser. Europe is the big loser. And you have to understand from a geopolitical point of view, the U.S. wanted to break um, uh, Europe uh, from uh, from uh, Asia and Russia. You know, if you look at the Eurasian continental plate, it's four and a half billion people. Okay. That's 10 times as uh, large as NAFTA. And the trade uh, increased dramatically. Germany's trade with China is bigger than Germany's trade with the U.S. Wow. And the U.S. got concerned that if these guys integrate more and more, and there is a, a railroad, a direct railroad for cargo from Beijing to, to Germany, you see. Uh, so if these guys integrate more and more, we lose our influence on Europe. And that's why they had to break that. And Ukraine was the breaking point because by provoking Russia to attack, which was the plan, I mean, the regime change in uh, 2014 was orchestrated by the US. And, uh, and by forcing the Europeans into sanctions against Russia, it was the first step in the break. And uh, they are trying to force Europe into sanction against China which will not work because that would be horrible for Europe. So it's a, it's a different setup. Europe has virtually no commodities, very few, right. very little in commodities. So we are dependent on the Middle East. And if I were the leader of uh, the European uh, nations or even one of the bigger economies, I would travel to the Middle East and make sure that I get all the stuff I need for our economies, you know, back and forth. They are sitting tight. They are flying to climate conferences and, and, and such things. You know, they, they do not get it in how weak a position Europe is. And I do not see any change. I think Europe is the biggest loser of all of that. And that will be seen in the currency long term. Wow. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that I should have? Maybe gold. Gold. Maybe gold. Uh, you know, I'm constructive on gold, but I think the recent rise was for the wrong reasons. It was geopolitics. Uh, and actually, gold rose together with real interest rates, which has virtually never happened before. And, uh, and, and probably means that gold is uh, very short term, not sustainable, needs a rest. Eventually, it will go higher. I don't see a lot of downside and it will go higher. I think next year we will see 2,500 or so. And do you look at gold really as a currency hedge more than anything else? Or do you look at it as an inflation hedge? I think in the longer term, uh, particularly in the second half of the 20s, what I described about uh, rising interest rates, rising inflation, rising interest rates, and then a crisis. And in that crisis, I think our governments will underwrite the economies. Unlike in the 1930s, when they had a stable gold-anchored currency mm -hmm. and they let the economy down, I think next time they will underwrite the economy and let the currencies go down. And then gold takes off in a big way. Felix, uh, we need to get you to the Strategic Investment Conference. I wish it was sooner. Uh, it will be the end of April this year, and uh, I hope you can you can go longer and deeper with us at that point. With pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Ed. It's always a pleasure speaking to you. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Felix Zuloff. By the way, we've got a great month lined up for you here at Global Macro Update. Next week, we speak with former Federal Reserve economist Claudia Sam, and then we'll hear from our favorite political pollster, 
Dr. Frank Luntz for a tour of the U.S. presidential candidates and what he's hearing in the field. Be sure to subscribe to Global Macro Update on our website. Subscribers get a free weekly email with a link to each new video, my additional comments on these interviews, and a full transcript. There's a link in the description below where you can get all the details.